Well, welcome. We really do welcome you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I'm Frank Fear with my colleague Ruben Martinez, and we're here to talk about neoliberalism in the age of Trump. Uh, and we're very, very pleased to have with us uh, Eric Jurgensmeyer, who's with us as one of the co-presenters today, as well as Anthony Nocella. Uh, and we're also very pleased to have with us uh, two very good discussants, uh, Jason Delgandio and also Amy Jacobson, uh, Jameson. So we appreciate very much your being here with us today uh, and those who are watching live on YouTube. Uh, you know, one of the things that was asked me recently is uh, the title of neoliberalism in the age of Trump. I get the neoliberalism, but isn't the age of Trump over? Well, absolutely not. Uh, one of the things that uh, we said to frame this session was, uh, I think we think is very, very true. And that is that neoliberalism expanded and deepened during the Trump years, uh, something that really continued. It's been five decades at least now of that. It, it deepened and extended and expanded during that time. And so it's still very much with us. Uh, and uh, one of the things that, that Ruben and I are always trying to do uh, is on the lookout for really good literature. And we were very much impressed with the, with, uh, the most recent book by our presenters, uh, Neoliberalism and Academic Repression. Why don't we start by, uh, by turning to our presenters to introduce themselves after Ruben has a chance to introduce himself to you. So Ruben, let's start with you. Good morning, everyone. I also want to thank uh, Anthony, Eric, uh, Jason and Amy uh, for their for their willingness to uh, share their ideas with us this morning. I'm Ruben Martinez. I'm a professor of sociology here at Michigan State University and also the director of the Julian Zamora Research Institute, a Latino focused research institute. And I got into academic uh, uh, freedom issues and academic repression and so on. Uh, through the lens of Latinos. So I'm very pleased to uh, be able to join you today and look forward to the discussion. Very good. Eric, let's uh, turn to you. My name is Dr. Eric Jorgensmeyer. I'm a professor of English here at uh, Fort Lewis College in lovely Durango, Colorado. Thank you so much for being here. Anthony. Uh, my name is Anthony Nicella. Um, I'm a professor at Salt Lake Community College um, also involved in Save the Kids and the Institute for Critical Mill Studies, um, and I'm an activist scholar. Excellent. Jason? Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Delgandio. I'm an associate professor at Temple University in Philadelphia. Um, some expertise I refer to as the theory and practice of social justice. Uh, over the years, I've done some work with neoliberalism, uh, both with Anthony, I've worked also with Eric over the years on different projects. I'm just happy to be here and, and uh, learn what everyone has to say. Thank you. Thank you. Amy. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy Jamison. I'm co-director of the Alliance for African Partnership. I'm based at Michigan State University. Alliance for African Partnership is a consortium of MSU and 10 African universities and an African think tank. Um, and my background's in, in higher education systems uh, and faculty experiences in African academic systems. Thank you very much, Amy. And we have a number of colleagues who are with us in the Zoom room today. So why don't we ask them to introduce themselves? We'll start, uh, we'll just go down the list. Let's start with Zach. You're on, you're on uh, mute there, if you could unmute yourself. Cool. Hey everyone, I'm Zach Kaiser. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Art, Art History and Design here at Michigan State University, um, sitting in the basement next to my turntables, which is a thing I, I sometimes would rather be doing. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you for being here. Nathan. Uh, my name is Nathan Russo. I'm associate professor of sociology at a branch campus of Indiana University. Nice to be here. Good to have you. Good to have you back too. Thank Bert, you. talking about being back. Thanks for being back, Bert. <laughs> good to be here. Uh, my name is Bert Bargerstock, and I'm the executive director of the Office for Public Engagement and Scholarship at MSU, uh, which is in the broader office of the Associate Provost for University Outreach and Engagement. Very good. Thanks, Bert. Marcello. 
Good afternoon to all of you. I'm Marcelo Siles. I'm a research specialist at the Julian Zamora Research Institute here at MSU. Very good. Good to see you again. Thank Jan. you. Hi, I'm Jan Beecher. Um, I work at MSU. I'm a political scientist by training, and I specialize in um, utility regulation and continuing education and applied research. Good. Good to see you again. And always good to see Susan. You have to unmute yourself there. Okay. Susan Mastin, I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering. Very good. And there is Terry. Hi there. I'm a, a retired uh, sustainability director and librarian from Michigan State University. Good to be here. Very good. And Jean? <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm a, a sociologist and social demographer for the Hurrian Samurai Research Institute here at MSU. Excellent. Very good. And you're Shira. Good to see you again. See you. Um, I'm a political scientist and a postdoctoral scholar with the Julian Samara Research Institute here at MSU. Very good. Again, thank you all for being here and also those that are watching live on YouTube. Uh, Ruben, um, would you like to offer additional comments to put this program in perspective before we turn to our presenters? Your choice. Thank you, Frank. Academic repression, academic freedom and tenure are all interconnected. In fact, academic freedom and academic repression represent two sides of the same coin and go back centuries. A codification occurred early in the 19th century in Germany under the Prussian reforms and what has come to be known as the Humboldtian University. Here in the United States, academic freedom began to receive sustained attention early in the 20th century and has been contested at different points in time, depending on the social movements prevalent in a given period. Our period is that of neo neoliberalism, that is the imposition of market principles and practices on society in which government intervention goes on unabashed and is accepted, and which today has blended with nativism and racism to produce what I call neoliberal nationalism. One in which we have patriotic cor correctness a movement to secure uniformity of belief and perspective, which threatens both the freedom of inquiry and the advancement of science. Academic repression has become increasing, increasingly embedded within today's universities. Today, we'll be hearing from our presenters more precisely what academic repression is, what forms it takes, and what forms it has taken in the age of Trump. I'm looking forward to the presentations and to the discussions and the question and answer discussion that occurs after that. Back to you, Frank. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a, a terrific uh, lead in, I think, uh, Anthony, for you to uh, actually lead us off. Uh, again, we valued so much uh, your scholarship with your colleagues. And so uh, thanks for joining us and please, the floor is yours. Sure, uh, thank you so much y'all for having me. Uh, and uh, I'm on stolen land uh, um, and, uh, and so on Turtle Island. And so I just want to kind of recognize that and, and recognize that we are um, speaking about uh, an apparatus and concept um, that is very invisible. And so when I speak today, I'm not going to define in a linear fashion uh, the concepts to you. It will be more of an experiential educational opportunity. Um, one might even argue, uh, which I'm not an expert at, uh, but, uh, but a decolonizing pedagogy, which I hope that will be the, the experience today um, of how can we disrupt a linear conversation um, and a dialogue, right? Um, so, uh, so neoliberalism education, uh, I would say really got started um, in the 60s uh, and the coups of imperialism and U.S. imperialism when the CIA was very involved in uh, the anthropology AAA or the Peace Corps and fostering itself on a global level. Um, but it was sloppy. It was like not even a 1.0, but they were doing it. They were creating 
a global imperialism. And so I think if we are going to have a class or a course or a workshop or a teaching on uh, decolonizing, as well as neoliberalism or neoconservatism, you've got to begin talking about the di distinctions between imperialism and colonialism. Um, and to understand the two uh, is very important. And I, um, and I try to do it in all my classes. I don't care what the class is. Every single course um, has to discuss and identify the difference between colonialism and imperialism, right? So colonialism is I'm going to take, and I'm just going to use Jason um, as my example. I'm going to take uh, something from Jason's house and make money from it. I'm going to steal, I'm going to bust in his window, go to his house and take it. That's colonialism. Very, uh, very violent, very direct um, and, and, and very clear and deliberate on my actions where imperialism is I don't want Jason to leave. I'm not going to break into his house. I'm just going to kind of influence him psychologically, deliberately, indeliberately, unconsciously and consciously of how to and what to buy from me so I can make money. So I'm going to make him my consumer. And so if we go to China, Japan, um, all over the world, we'll see people wearing Nike clothing, specifically Michael Jordan, right? Like that is imperialism, right? Um, where uh, colonialism is, I go to these countries and just uh, steal all of their resources, right? Um, so it's not that one is better than the other um, in violence aspect, uh, but I would say that they play um, a very different role, but they are in relationship, a very um, violent, but but intertwined, interdependent relationships. So how do those two things intertwine in education? Well, um, well, we see its face um, in neoliberalism where we conduct acts uh, and we market those acts um, to benefit us. Meaning they, uh, neoliberalism is to uh, be self-serving. It is about me, not us. And I think that is the premise people Hey, if you want to know about neoliberalism, just read my books, right? Like that, like we need to kind of discuss neoliberalism in a sentence. And that sentence is neoliberalism is self-serving specifically around economically speaking frameworks, right? So it's, it's self-serving that it profits um, off of people for me. Uh, so, uh, so for example, um, we see, that the Shell Corporation spills a whole bunch of uh, oil into the oceans. And then next month, they're planting 500 trees in a national forest in the United States, right? So um, that is an example of neoliberalism at its finest, right? And I think uh, one of the, the greatest uh, examples um, that really uh, um, consumes what neoliberalism is, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton is neoliberalism, right? Like he really is an expert on neoliberalism, right? Like he was, I, um, if I recall correctly, I, I remember him being like identified as the first black president, right? Like, and like him not even like critiquing that. Like it was like, yeah, like, whoa, that is highly problematic. Like that is, you know, racism at its finest, right? Um, while at the same time he was creating the worst oppressive <laughs> crime bill in 1994 that ever existed while destroying the middle class where he aided in NAFTA, the, the WTO, where I was organizing in um, the battle in Seattle, which, you know, some of the people that will be watching this, this video will be like 1999. I wasn't even born then. I was like, I was, I was taking trains and vans and buses and we were on train hopping all the way to 1990 nine in November um, and protesting the WTO, right? And then after that was the Washington DC protest. And then they started doing the G8s and the G16s and all over the Toronto and Mexico city, et cetera. So Bill Clinton really destroyed the middle class, sent it overseas um, and then said, well, we do have products that are made in America, right? And that like, that really resonated with a lot of people. But the problem was nobody was critical in saying where exactly were the products made? 
i.e. in prisons, right? Like, so he created the 1994 crime bill, put 100,000 police on the streets that were a lot of them had felonies and were highly corrupt. And so they were arresting a lot of people for petty crimes. And then we um, increased uh, um, crime and he did it in the name of caring for society, right? And caring for the working class person while destroying the working class by sending the factories over uh, overseas, right? Um, and so we need to really understand uh, neoliberalism in that aspect. And I think, you know, we can just examine Bill Clinton and how people try to play out that. And I think if we if we fast forward and I'll kind of wrap up here, if we fast forward from Bill Clinton to Donald Trump. Right. So Bill Clinton did because Donald Trump really like attacked NAFTA. Right. Or, you remember this? Like he was like down with NAFTA and it was a brilliant strategy. He was going to challenge neoliberalism because he was a neoconservative. Right. And Donald, like you, if you and I'll let other people talk about the differences between neoliberalism and neoconservatism. But Bill Clinton was neoliberal where Donald Trump was neoconservative. Right. And Donald Trump was really fostering the essence of dogmatism. He did not want critical thinking. And one of the most powerful examples of the Donald Trump error, as Frank has noted, like, well, Donald Trump's over, right? Like Frank's like, no, not the Trump error, right? And the Trump error fostered the critique of critical race theory, right? And I hope that we kind of speak about that, right? Like we don't go after George Floyd protesters, right? For people protesting for George Floyd and the justice for George Floyd and the murder and the assassination of George Floyd, directly, what we do is we now from a neoconservative dogmatistic framework, we go after the theorist. As Paulo Freire has brilliantly said, you can't have action without theory. Theory comes before action. They read our books. Neoconservatives sat down, read our books, read our game plan, which was very public. And they said, all we'll do is destroy the academics, right? Donald Trump's agenda took David Horowitz, a neoconservative, right? I hope people know who David Horowitz was. He, he created the 101 Radical Dangerous Professors, right? Which I was one of them, which I was very proud of, right? And so he, he created this list, a coup to destroy higher ed and critical thinking. It was really, really sloppy and, and, and um, leftist kind of challenged it and then smiled and then put it on their CV. Where where now we're not targeting people in neoconservatism. What we're doing is we're, we're targeting ideas. And that is what, um, what is very dangerous, right? Um, and the first time we saw it was the Patriot Act signed in October in 2001. It went after ideas, not people. So that's what I'll, I'll, I'll sum up right there and we'll have more of a conversation. Very good, thank you so much. Uh, Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, is my microphone okay or should I keep leaning forward? It's good. Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks, Anthony. It's great to see you. Great to work with you as always. And thanks, Frank and Ruben and uh, Jason and Amy as discussants and everyone here today. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to downshift a little bit and talk a little bit more about what got me into this project and what led Anthony and I into uh, editing these, uh, co editing these two books. So for me, is really entering academia and watching the institution change. And for me, that came through this like culture of assessment and accountability and measurability. And I got involved with our, uh, with my institution's reaccreditation organization, the Higher Learning Commission, and this kind of sense of continuous improvement that excluded our faculty ownership. And I study assessment and, and uh, I'm a compositionist and rhetorician by trade here in the English department, and, and I studied and prepared for assessment, and then I experienced this harsh reality of how we were assessed and how that assessment, student learning outcomes, SLOs and signature assignments, and, and I, I got to experience how that was influencing my curriculum, 
are as, as a former uh, I'm a recovering administrator, as the former writing program director, I got to experience how we had to organize our curriculum around those SLOs and around the signature assignments that every faculty member had to teach. And it was that, that culture of assessment and accountability as the central organizing feature that really got me interested in um, better understanding how to combat that and how to address that. And um, that led to uh, working with Anthony and this is our second book together. Our first book was uh, Fighting Academic Repression and Neoliberal Education there, a little blurry with my blurry feature. But um, that's, a, that's an interesting kind of meta-disciplinary book that involves English and sociology and history and law and geography, a lot of very disciplines and, and hearing people's stories and their narratives and their experiences uh, and what has happened to them in the classroom and by their, uh, by administrators um, really opened my eyes to this awareness. Um, and then, um, then I, I moved on to this next book that we're here to talk about today. And then Anthony and I thought about, and Mark Cease, and we're sorry Mark can't be here. He's uh, enjoying retirement too much. So he's, I think he's gardening today. So he, he can't join us, but Mark is very influential in this project. And, um, and then we wanted to see how different theoretical frames could help us better understand neoliberalism. And that's what Anthony was just discussing. Um, we, we, want, we did that through Marx and Foucault. By the way, it's a little bit hard to talk about Foucault right now after the March interview with Guy Sorman. And I don't know uh, what to do with that. I, I don't know about if we want to talk about the canceling of Foucault, if we want to talk about accepting his ideas, but there's some disturbing, you know, it's hard to talk about Foucault after reading that interview. Um, so uh, just to digress there. Um, so, so that's what led us to these projects, right? The first project was collecting stories, understanding it across disciplines. And then this project was how can we use theoretical frameworks to better understand and interpret this far reach of neoliberalism in our experiences. So then I also uh, co-authored uh, a chapter in each of these volumes. And the first uh, in, in fighting academic repression, I worked on a project with Sue so Do, who's a colleague of mine from Colorado State. She's also a former writing program director there and uh, heavily involved with uh, faculty governance like I am at my institution. And what Sue and I did was we detailed our experiences working at the state level on curriculum design. And we would go to Denver and all of the uh, major schools were represented and we designed curriculum. And at that point, we were experiencing a legislative push to eliminate our remedial writing courses. And the whole country was experiencing this and it was being pushed by corporations. And there was a lot of this finish and floor, put your students in buckets, get them through. And what we had designed as faculty was a prerequisite program to help our remedial students be better prepared for learning. And the state said, no, that can't happen anymore in the state of Colorado. You have to use a co-requisite model, this writing studio, this lab model. And Sue and I were there in the trenches, so to speak, sorry. Um, <clears throat> but we got to experience how we had experience as writing professors, as rhetoricians, as curriculum designers. And we had to modify our institution's curriculum based on what the legislature was saying, based on what they were reading or being influenced by corporations. And that was really disconcerting for us. And today we have this model that's broken, right? This co-requisite one credit uh, course studio, lab studio, accompanying our first year writing courses. And that, that was super problematic. And what's worse is that we don't even have those faculty conversations anymore. They eliminated the faculty participation in that program. So whereas we used to go to Denver and at least get to deliberate and, and discuss it, now it's just general administrative representation with some mandates that come down to us that tell us how to design our courses. And you know, I used to be, I was the Western Slope representative and elected position to work with all of our programs and we had a voice. Now we don't even have a voice anymore, which is really unfortunate. So that's what, that's what kind of Sue and I got to see this, uh, this, this neoliberalism accountability, right? And, uh, 
you know, interestingly, I'd love to talk about this if there's any, uh, any uh, anyone interested in writing, but this same model exists in our writing courses with the researched essay, right? This neoliberal concept of accountability and the go-to assignment in first year writing, right? Our students can hop into our course, and of course, at the remedial, they haven't had any preparation. And within four weeks, one unit, right, we'll teach them some grammar, some correctness, some style. That's what everyone thinks grammar and writing instruction is, which is connected with what we're talking about. And then we have this, this research argument, this go-to assignment in all of our writing courses that we're expecting our students, our first-year students, to be able to read scholarship, critically analyze scholarship, engage with ideas, work from those sources, not just use them in their papers to, to embellish their ideas, but work with them and then produce this document, right? So I'm kind of an anti-research argument uh, faculty member as well. And that leads me to focusing on genre which is what I've done in the, in the second book in my co-authored piece. So that's another uh, way, I think, in writing instruction. And I'm curious, I'll look forward to hearing what Jan has to say about her work with applied research later on, but I'm really interested in how we teach research and what we're expecting of students in those models. So um, working on the, the, the second text, uh, um, I worked with a colleague, Brad Benz from Denver University, who's also a former writing program director. We're seeing a pattern here, right? We, we experience that and have to succumb to those pressures and no longer want to do it. And what Brad and I did was we examined how corporate think tanks, those same think tanks that were influencing the state legislature, we examined how those organizations were appropriating discourse to influence the legislature. So we kind of shifted down from there. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with National Association of Scholars, aside from uh, Brad and my article, right? The NAS, they're a pretty nasty bunch, right? So Peter Wood, their head, he's a big uh, anti-climate change, uh, uh, he's a climate change uh, opponent. And he's presented some really shoddy ideas appropriating academic research, appropriating academic discourse to influence uh, Congress, right? He's had congressional audiences for his ideas. So what Brad and I did was we use this Foucauldian frame of the episteme and discursive formations to identify and, and genre, right? We took rhetorical genre studies ideas. And we argued that what's happening is these corporations are emulating academic research, but there's no research there. There's no foundation to their ideas, but they're dressing this up, making it look like it, appropriating our genre. And then Brad and I examined this National Association of Scholars attempt to eliminate civics education, right? Which is pretty conservative push for, I, I really like that neoliberal nationalism idea for grouping, right? And that's what the NAS is doing with their civics education. And then we have this episteme, right, that limits and governs what we think and how we do. And that's kind of led to my research agenda. I'm, I'm just at about uh, nine minutes now, so I'll just give it another. Um, and that's led to my work, right, which is understanding language, understanding the power tied into language, and choosing what we do. I also think we need to think about our scholarship. That's one reason I really like this forum so much, right? It's not this expensive, uh, academic edited volume, right? The hardcover of this book was really expensive. And I'm so happy that we got the, the hard, the soft back uh, version of it and it was more affordable. But this is what, we're, what we need right now is this type of form. Um, and then this, this makes me think about research methodology and I'm moving in that direction with my just reference about Jan and applied research. I'm moving more towards an, uh, an action research model in what I do, right, to value that more. And, and that's where I'm heading right now, right? And then a final note would be, you know, a major takeaway I think from this book is fighting academic freedom challenges, fighting neoliberalism happens in the classroom. It happens when we question trigger warnings, as one of the chapters in our book does. It happens when we seriously examine the science communication problem as one of the chapters in our book does. It happens when we call out the educational industrial complex and those corporations that are influencing how we finish in four and put students in buckets. So I'll end on that note. 
at 11 minutes, sorry. But uh, I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. <laughs> Both of you did a splendid job. And that's why we invited you to uh, do this forum. And thank you so much for your very thoughtful uh, presentations. Let's turn to Jason for his comment. Um, well, first, uh, thank you both to uh, Anthony and Eric for your comments and your talks. Um, obviously, you've put a lot on the table. Uh, there's no way that I can respond to everything you guys said. It's, it's, obviously, it's not possible, right? Um, but trying to find ways in my own mind to summarize uh, what we've heard so far and then move that conversation forward. Um, so first, the link between uh, Trumpism and neoliberalism, right? And to use one of the words from Anthony uh, in terms of uh, dogma, right? Each of these is a dogma. Um, and that dogma has serious effects on our psyches, our behaviors, our choices, et cetera. And to tie that into what Ruben said early on, uh, this notion of uh, neoliberal nationalism, right? And so in my mind, listening to this, this this discussion, I'm wondering like, how does uh, this dogma of neoliberal nationalism tie into higher education? Right? And I would say, uh, as I'm sure the term we're all, we're all familiar with, um, the academic industrial complex, right? And what is this complex doing? What is this uh, industrial complex doing? Well, it's trying to infuse higher ed with this dogma and trying to weed out people like us, right? Um, the critical thinkers, the critical theorists, um, the critical pedagogues, who they're trying to produce certain kinds of research that has a positive, you know, radical transformation on society, uh, creating a classroom where it's a space for genuine dialogue, for actual human connection, right? And so we see, in my mind, I see it as a, like a grand battle, right? We have this massive dogma, um, both from the economic side, but also from the political side, and obviously those two things are obviously infused here. And then you have uh, spaces like this right here, right this, in this moment, that are trying to resist and challenge all of that, right? Which makes me think about uh, the term decolonization that Anthony talked about, right? Kind of on a grander scale, but also on the micro scale in terms of what Eric was talking about in terms of um, like an anti-research assignment, right? And so how do, we, how do we resist this dogma on the, the highest level possible in terms of social movements, right? Transforming the academy itself, but also on the micro um, sense of what do we do as academics on a daily basis in terms of our teaching, our research, and our service, right? And so if we think about uh, the dog in terms of being self-serving all the time, right? Trump and Trumpism as well as neoliberalism, capitalism as a whole, right? How can we as individuals uh, be other serving? Right? Um, and then how do we connect our individual efforts though at a larger scale in terms of some kind of social movement, whether it's a formal social movement or a more diffuse uh, social agenda that we bring to our teaching, to our service work, to our research, things like that, right? Um, and then how do certain kinds, this is what's going through my mind right now, how do certain kinds of events that we can't foresee coming affect both what we want to do, but then also affect this uh, neoliberal nationalism Right. So, for instance, one of the questions I have right now is how does this everything that we're talking about right now in this uh, this discussion, how does it relate to things that are happening with the pandemic right? um, in terms of our teaching, our scholarship, our relations with our students, with our with our colleagues? Right. Um, we don't have to answer that question. It's one of the things that's going through my mind um, right now. I mean, very briefly, I would say that the pandemic. As exasperated probably neoliberalism on a global scale in terms of who gets the vaccine, who doesn't get the vaccine, what's happening around different countries, things like that, who's profiting from this, right? Is this a public good or is this for private wealth? Um, anyway, I'll, I'll pause there now because I don't go on too long, but um, I was trying to summarize everything that was said, but then have us think as individuals, like how do we resist this dogma in our individual lives in terms of uh, ac being academics, but also how do we facilitate all of our efforts into a, a larger kind of movement. So I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jason. You have the floor, Amy. Thank you. Thanks, Frank, and thanks, Anthony and Eric. I've been furiously writing notes here and taking some ideas um, from, you, you've sparked a lot of ideas in my mind. And, 
and sort of I come at it from a, a global or international ed perspective, um, engaging with uh, universities, you know, around the globe and mostly in Africa. And uh, the, the first thing you started out with, uh, Ruben, was on the neoliberal nationalism. And as someone situated in, in um, uh, trying to advocate for a global engagement, but equitable, transparent, um, research for the global common good engagement, it's something that's constantly a, a tension in uh, our work at, at MSU, but also you know, in terms of the types of funding we're going after, in types of, in terms of the types of research that we're supporting and engaging, and in terms of how we're working with universities around the globe in, in, um, in thinking through, uh, you know, how we might support them to build educational systems. And, and that brought me to the idea, you know, as Anthony was talking about imperialism and the subtleness of imperialism to adapt systems, um, you know, neoliberal systems in other, around the, around the world and thinking about higher ed systems in, in other countries um, and, and how the neoliberal influence that has really shaped the, the current state of, of education and higher education in the US um, is really impacting other universities and is taken as a natural, this is the natural order of things and this is how we should guide other universities to move towards. So that's something that's a constant tension and, and uh, um, Jason, you mentioned, how does this play into your day-to-day -day work and life? And that's something I'm, uh, I'm really trying to, to think through as well, sitting in an administrator's position. I'm not a faculty member in a classroom. My role is to support faculty um, to do their research, to do their work, and, and also support other institutions to, you know, working in a higher edu education and capacity development, that's what we call it, um, uh, thinking through, you know, how can you, how can you work in that space and, and resist some of those pieces that are taken as a natural given? You know, when I work on USAID programs, we're talking about the US government, they, you know, the, the, the um, assumptions that are made within those programs are, how do you challenge that? How do you work on that? And, and so I'm, I'm sitting in a very interesting and in tension filled position in my in my work and um, being committed to the type of work of social justice. Um, it's, it, you know, how do you think through these these different areas as Eric was saying assessment being a major piece, what do we want to accomplish in this. And a lot of the rhetoric that's out there now is around workforce development. We want people, you know, in Africa specifically, we, we have a, a huge uh, growth of the youth population. And so how are we going to get them jobs? How are we going to get them, you know, um, economically stable? And, and but, but is that really the, the focus of education? And is that really the, the end all be all of education? And how do we question that in our work? And I, I sort of was taking what, um, what Eric was saying around you know, thinking about how we structure our curriculum and what do we want to accomplish for students within that space. Um, let me see, any other? Yeah, I think those were the, the pieces that really struck out, st stuck out to me and, and sort of trying to take it a, a different, different perspective influenced by, by what you all have said, but I, I really, it's, it sparked a lot of thinking in, uh, in my own work, so thank you. Well, thank you. You know, as you all were talking, I was thinking about the dedication to the book, the difference between higher schooling and higher education. And that's really the challenge we, I think we all have because we're, we're dedicated to higher education. The question is, what is that in relationship to the, this overarching neoliberal uh, frame of reference, both in society writ large, but also in the institution of higher education? Thank you all so much, Ruben. Let's uh, let's turn to uh, the discussion phase of of this forum. But let me turn to you first uh, for your comments, and then if you would facilitate the conversation, that would be great. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I'm interested in the way that academic repression has become embedded in the lives of academics. Uh, in the most of subtle ways, say for instance, the notion of civility, how civility is being uh, focused on these days. And, you know, concepts always are, their meaning is always embedded in a system of values, in a system of beliefs and so forth. 
And so uh, I wonder if you could, uh, both Anthony and Eric could speak to the subtlety of how civility itself, the new policies and so forth are being used both to uh, intimidate faculty, to silence faculty and to control faculty uh, at the individual level in ways that we hadn't thought about before. I could, Eric, I was just jotting down notes and then if you wanna to respond to that'd be beautiful. Um, I think this neoliberal pedagogy shows its face um, through, I, I've written, I don't know, 10 years ago about repressive pedagogy and repressive pedagogy has tactics. And, and at that time I didn't have, you know, the certain uh, cultures within schooling, which schooling I define as education plus institution equals schooling, right? So education can be you on the street corner. It can, it can be at a hip hop club. It could be, you know, a low rider show. It could be at an art fest. It could be, you know, graffiti in the middle of the night on a train. Like education can be anywhere, right? Um, but schooling is a very violent place. And we need to understand that, you know, for example, Cornell University to eliminate suicide, they put bob wire around their gorges so people don't jump over. Like they don't, they don't get radical on saying, wait a second, maybe we need to kind of address depression, standardization and anxiety and stress um, and what causes that. And maybe what, you know, Paulo Freire, John Dewey, et cetera, have talked about, bell hooks, um, have talked about, about education being liberatory. Education is a violent place. It, you know, teachers can be a heck of a lot more violent uh, than a police officer um, because they can begin to hate yourself. You know, look at the, uh, you know, the 1950s um, internalized oppression of, of young black youth saying that the good, the good doll is the white doll and the black doll is the bad doll, right? And so I think, um, you know, looking at this and you, Ruben, you were noting like, what are some strategies? I, I would say strategies to be fearful that if somebody comes up to you and says these words, they might be a neoliberal, right? Like we see these memes, like you might be a neoliberal if you um, say like, we should be all civil, um, have civility or um, can't we just all get along or let's be collegial or can't, can't we be fair about this or um, they promote a respectability politics. And I think a pedagogy that we need to promote is a disruptive, critical, decolonizing, liberatory pedagogy, like hip hop pedagogy, lowrider pedagogy, decolonizing pedagogy, queer pedagogy, um, that doesn't have rules. Hip hop doesn't have rules, right? Like in a matter of speaking, right? Like it's not dogmatic. And I would, I, I, I see as Jason says, like the academic industrial complex and the corporate education and how they need to be kind of noted in this conversation while not maybe expanded upon because we just don't have the time. But what we are in 10, 15 years ago, Henry Giroux, all of us, Peter McLaren, Bell Hooks, we're all talking about standardization, the fear of standardization. What we are now in is the fear of rubricization, the rubricization of education and how we live in a rubric error of kids and children and adults and students saying, not 30 years ago saying, hey, can I write 50 pages? Can I write 60 pages? And can it be on tie dye? And can I do it through a hip hop perspective? Now, students come up to you, get anxiety and say, Eric, Eric, I need rubric, I need structure. Is it five words or six words? Is it a bullet point or is it an essay? And they get anxiety if they don't have structure. So, you know, it is true that the prison has become the school and the school has become the prison. So I don't know if that um, articulates what you were asking for, Ruben, but, you know, we're kind of moving in that direction of like really narrowing down and pinpointing what the problem is. And, you know, Eric, I don't know if you have some examples or um, I can expand upon that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, thanks, Ruben. Great question. Try not to replicate everything I just said earlier. Um, you know, Mark Cease's chapter in our book, um, he talks about our syllabi. And there are these long contracts with students, right? And that's this expectation of civility. Taney Duncan's chapter in our book talks about, as I mentioned earlier, trigger warnings. Be careful what you choose to discuss. Be careful what 
with what books that you want to discuss. Uh, be careful how critical, how critical you want your students to think. And what are people going to say when we constantly have to have trigger warnings on our syllabi for our topics, for our content, for the books we choose to mm. discuss? Um, I really like Anthony's uh, example of rubrics, right? Um, and, and what are what? Maybe it's what we have to say, but maybe it's what we can't do. How much time do we have? Our our writing courses used to be four credits each. Now they're three credits each. Um, within those three credits, we have to address 16 student learning outcomes. Some of those are correctness. Some of those are conformity to standard written English, to conventions, stylistic conventions. So I think those are the subtle ways mm -hmm. in which civility is being, is we are delivering to our students. And then, of course, as, as we mentioned a couple of times, it's also through our research paradigms. Mm -hmm. We might be silencing narratives. We might be silencing personal experiences. When we're requiring our students to write with authority, using concrete evidence from trusted sources. And I'll stop there. But great question, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And, and Eric, I really appreciate your, uh, your responses. Uh, Nathan, you're on. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I agree with, with everything that's, that's being said here. Um, but I, I uh, in listening to all of it, I, um, I tried to take a step back and uh, and observe the what I what I think is a a big a big picture. And uh, I want to read to you what I've what I've written down. The country is fighting over what is legitimate knowledge. Is it a vision of the past with strong institutions or is it a vision of the future with greater expression of individual liberties? Both sides use references from the other where it suits them. Those in favor of strong institutions also talk in the language of liberty and those in favor of greater individual expression rely upon particular social institutions where it serves their interests. Both neglect the present where particular individuals are profiting from these conflicts and are inaccessible because everyone is dependent upon them. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, who wants to go first, Eric, Anthony? Sure. All right, Eric. <laughs> um, I had a conversation with students last night um, or two nights ago in, in prison. I teach in a prison uh, course um, and uh, and we were talking about how the pri prison industrial complex, which emerged out of Bill Clinton, you know, in a matter of speaking, was the relationship between private corporations like Victoria's Secret, Jansport, Verizon, AT&G, JCPenney's, the list goes on. Um, and how they were doing factoring um, because the Pell Grants were shot out the window because of Bill Clinton, right? Um, and they were placed, schools were replaced with factories. And so, and I said, that was, you know, the prison industrial complex. Then we have private prisons, right? Like 2.0. And then 3.0, which doesn't exist because my students were like, well, you know, um, private prisons are like even more dangerous than than the prison industrial complex. And I said, yes, but a 2.0 of the private industrial complex or the prison, the private prisons is they still um, use Nike uh, to put shoes on people that are in prison. They still have Frito-Lay. They, um, they still outsource their food and outsource their clothes. So they still have contracts with private corporations where the 3.0 is they don't they don't outsource or insource, should I say, insource their products from private corporations. They, they get the prisoners to make the sneakers and the sneakers are then bought by the prisoners, right? And so why I say that is that we need to understand how academic repression is just the factory and the, the diploma mill of pushing out a lot of students. And we see it in, in public universities a lot where we stack the, a lot of students in a, in a place, we just push them through where corporate, corporate education is where you, 
have a relationship with the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security or NSA or corporations to say, can you train these people um, in such a way that they'll be ready to be hired by us? And now what is happening, and Trump is a brilliant example of it, is we have public, we have private institutions that are for for profit colleges that are now saying we don't need to um, outsource uh, a corporation to then send our students to, we will be our own corporation. So now I'm getting, I'm getting taught by the, the Trump university and then I'll get hired by the Trump corporation. And so now we'll have Lockheed Martin university. We'll have, um, we'll have GE university. We will have, um, you know, JC Penny university, Procter and Gamble Lockheed university. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's already happening. Proc, you know, um, JP Morgan, et cetera, KPMG um, University. And they're just, tr and they're accredited institutions without any critical thinking. And they're just, they're like, why were we ever outsourcing our education? The corporation said, we don't need Syracuse University. We don't need, you know, Fort Lewis College. We don't need Temple University. We don't need Michigan State University. We'll just create our own university and we'll make money off of our people. And then guess what? They're going to get loans, student loans, not from banks, but from us. So they're going to be completely indebted to us. They can't leave our corporation and they will be our own, our own neoliberal enslavement, right? Does, if that makes sense, right? And so I think we need to kind of understand that because what we're creating is, if anybody's in the field of education, we're destroying foundations of education, the theory of education, and we're replacing it with leadership education. So many people in PhDs are getting leadership education at UCLA, at, at Stanford University, which is like a puppet for Pearson um, or University of Wisconsin. They're, they're replacing foundations of education PhD programs with leadership PhD programs. Amy, you might want to kind of note that, like, you know, say more about that because you're an expert on that kind of that, that subversive strategy. But that's what I wanted to say. I don't know if ever, you know, you want to begin. Yeah, um, Nathan, I really appreciate your thoughts. Um, I might be missing uh, the, the general gist of your question. I don't necessarily want to live in this binary of the past and, and the future or, or different ways we're going. I think we are in the present. And I think what we're doing and I think what these last two projects have done is given people tools to create in the present uh, ways to combat this movement. So I'll just leave it there. But thank you, I appreciate your thoughts, but I don't think I want to go to that binaristic focus. Thank you to the two of you. Uh, does anyone else have a question? Um, I could, could I jump in, Ruben, and talk what Anthony was talking about, the leadership PhD issue and sort of the orientation of education, is that okay? Sure, that's fine. And then Jason will, will um, uh, speak on it. Sure, yeah. Anthony, I couldn't agree with you more. This is sort of my space that I'm like sort of fighting in this all the time um, in terms of, you know, how do we shape education and, and how do we look at what the outcomes of education are? Um, we're told constantly in, uh, in working with universities on the African continent and, uh, you know, but also here at MSU, um, to involve the private sector, engage the private sector. We need to know the private sector needs to be telling us what skills our students need to have, what's employable, and and um, and and we're constantly told there's a mismatch of the education that students are receiving in universities and what what uh, instit what what private sector is what the private sector is looking for. And we're constant. I mean, that's like the the running theme in in every call for proposal I get in every um, in every report I'm reading in, in the development space. And it, but I think it's the same in, in US and and then reorienting programs, not just, you know, to title them leadership education, not just because that's, um, you know, the the hot lingo for for um, the private sector, but it's also the hot lingo for students. Students are attracted to those programs because they are told that those are the skills that are gonna get them the jobs that are gonna lead to this, rather than 
you know, this is what will make you a good human being. This is what will make you, you know, uh, help you function in the world with other people and, and, and engage. And so, um, but, but we constantly see a shift of institutions and, you know, as we see the resources dwindling, um, uh, that's happened in the U.S. for a long time, but, you know, um, in, uh, in African universities, it's like, it's just brutal like the, 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 the amount of resources that are available to do this. And so they're having to market new programs, um, find di- new ways of bringing in students that will attract them to their institutions. A lot of private sector institutions are cropping up. So marketing it as this leadership component, and I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty of saying we need leadership skills for, for, our, for the students that we're working with. But what does that actually mean? What does that actually prepare students for? Uh, I think that's something we have to we have to continue to question and and it's it's really challenging because it is just so dominant in the narrative. It's so dominant in the in the in the narrative and and how we should orient our educational institutions. Um, so that's my comment on that. Thank you, Amy. I'd like to just follow up with that really quickly, if you don't mind. But yeah, and this must really affect your work, right, with grants and. And, and funding, right? And in the grant world, it's about assessment. And it's about the evaluation of the productivity of the grant. And I'm also the coordinator of the Peace and Conflict Studies program here at Fort Lewis College. And I, I work with grants and students and projects for, for peace. And that's not so quantifiable, right? And, and we, you know, but when you're writing a grant, you have to say, we're gonna have these outcomes, these measurable things year one, year two, and year three. And we can't really measure peace and that growth and development. And John Paul Lederach, he's a great peace and conflict studies scholar. He's done a lot of really good work in teaching us ways to measure what cannot be simply measured in these grant cycles. So in the chat or something, I'd be happy to share one of his texts. It's it's actually free and online uh, where he advocates for ways for us as practitioners to demonstrate how our work isn't going to be so, I know I'm straying from the leadership idea, but I just wanted to follow through with that. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Jason? Um, Yeah, so I want to pose a question. It's really for everyone. It's not just for Eric and Anthony. Um, I like to hear anyone who wants to jump in with this, but when we have these kind of, when I participate in these kind of discussions and they're super heavy, and we're pointing out how everything is negative and bad, which I agree with. Trust me when I say that, 100%. That's not, that's not the issue, right? But I guess the, where do each of us find the hope to go do our work every day, right? So if the academy is as bad as it is, and I, I would agree that it is, right? But yet we all choose to be in the academy, right? And I would assume, and I, I could be wrong, but I, could, I, I assume we do that, though, because we still believe that our efforts can make a difference in the world, right? And so if that's true though, how do we, where do we find that hope to keep going, keep doing what we're doing? That's that's the question. Thank you, Jason. Who wants to take the first stab at that? (laughs) I'm happy to hear from the audience. I feel like I've been talking a lot, but uh, that's a great question. Go ahead, Eric. I'm happy to hear from the audience. I feel like I've been talking a lot about it, about that hope. Uh, for me, it's uh, my involvement uh, on shaping future policies, right? That's why I'm on the Budget Advisory Committee. That's why I'm on Faculty Senate. That's why I'm on the curriculum. I work with the curriculum. So thank you. Yeah. You know, Ruben, I think that's why these conversations are so important. And not just the conversations, but the network of colleagues. Um, I have a a colleague at the University of Utah who's written extensively about the concept of the bystander uh, linked to the concept of the enabler. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I realized that um, I was a bystander in the work that I was doing and then transitioned as an administrator Uh, And I became an enabler of the very thing that we're talking about. And the challenge is that because um, higher education is so demanding and the pace is so significant, it's a gerbil run. 
that it's sometimes difficult, if not impossible, to have the space to be reflective. And then for me, you wake up one morning and realize uh, I am the concern that I'm talking about. I am a participant observer, increasingly less an observer and increasingly more a participant. And it's, it's sobering. It's really sobering. So having a group of colleagues like this, the national network and a forum, uh, certainly on campuses, but also on a campus, but also intercampus, I think is extremely important. I, I'll say that, you know, I go and I go into areas where I feel um, a lot of work, a lot of work is needed. And so most of the work that I that I've been doing for a long time is either has something to do with education, particularly higher education or race relations. And, uh, you know, that's where I've I'm in those areas because I think those Areas need a lot of a, a lot of input from a lot of different people, and so that's that's my interest. I, I just want to add one more thing, and and I think a part of what groups like this um, really need to consider um, is that students are observing us use tools that um, our political and business leaders are using. And um, a lot of those tools, I mean, the way we're communicating right now, empower uh, neoliberal trends. And I think what people in higher education need to really think about is how tools like Microsoft uh, can be used better to work in a way that um, moves things away from neoliberalism rather than uh, profits it, which it does right now. Thank you, Nathan. I guess I'll take a stab at uh, uh, Jason's uh, question. Uh, from my point of view, nothing is absolute in the social world. And so neoliberalism has not fully uh, taken over higher education, although it has uh, transformed uh, some of the rules and so on. Uh, but one of the things that it's done is imposed this view of students as customers. In other words, that we are supposed to produce entrepreneurial subjects. These are uh, persons who are investing in their own human capital, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, whereas the old view was that we were to produce uh, critically informed persons who were, were able to uh, examine the world for themselves and uh, uh, take uh, approaches to the world that would make it better, uh, not only for themselves and for others. And so I believe that that space has not been completely erased and that uh, it is possible for us to still be here to preserve it and to recover it uh, and to help others understand what is going on. Uh, one of the things about uh, neoliberalism, as uh, Frank was saying, is that it was imposed on us in what I would call a stealth mode. Uh, we didn't know it was happening. And so that's why some of us at certain points in times have been active in reproducing it and, and, and uh, sustaining it and so forth. Uh, but once we figured it out, I think we've been uh, able to uh, resume our role as critical thinkers and public intellectuals and so on. Uh, recall that under authoritarian regimes and tyrannical regimes, it's the intellectuals that are taken out first as, because they want to impose uniformity of thinking uh, on everybody else. And so uh, I'm not ready to relinquish uh, my ability to engage in critical thinking and to uh, engage in activities as a public intellectual. Someone else? Otherwise, we can take another question, a different question. Yes, Amy? Uh, I, you know, I find a lot of hope in, um, in sort of the questioning of power dynamics that I'm able to do in, in my work and that MSU actually, you know, has set up this whole consortium um, and allowed us to question some of those power dynamics. I mean, yes, we have to rely on funding and we have to deal with that, but but at least we've been able to carve out some space 
um, to, to look at north-south power dynamics. How are universities in the US relating to African colleagues and how can we shift those power dynamics? You know, um, the fact that MSU is supporting this institution that is a consortium of all of these universities and, and disproportionately funding that is, I, I don't know, I find hope in that, that we're questioning those relationships. You know, we're questioning that we are not the center and all be all than the nationalist, neoliberalist, although there are, you know, there's still bad stuff going on and we still are not, you know, uh, pushing the envelope as it should be, but I do find hope in that. Um, I also find hope in, you know, the, the conversations that we're able to convene. We, we had a, a, a whole, I think it was Jason who brought up the vaccine distribution challenges. And, and we were able to convene people from across different sectors and academics who are, and, you know, activists who are based in communities to bring this together. I, I find hope that there's still things like that happening. And obviously the future you conversations are, are a piece of that. So that's sort of where, where I'm at in my, in my motivation in life to continue my work as much as the challenges are huge. Thank you, Amy. Someone else have a comment or a question? Well, I wanna thank Jason for that very provocative and important question. I think we have to be the hope that we seek. Um, we have to be. And, and that includes, um, uh, going back to what Anthony talked about, we have to be able to name, uh, we have to disdain uh, after we've named it, and we have to bring awareness to circumstances because as Ruben talked about, it's, it's stealth. One of the things that I've been, um, been exposed to that I had not been exposed to was, is what's going on in the high schools. And I've had two experiences recently in the high schools. I have no idea uh, if, if this is a prevailing perspective, but in one high school, uh, I heard a principal talk and the um, emphasis was on how good the athletic teams were and how good the food was in the high school. And I said to myself, and I talked about this with colleagues who were in that audience afterwards, of all the things a principal of a high school could talk about to lead and to emphasize was athletics and food. Uh, and I was at a graduation ceremony recently, which I later found out after I spoke out, it was the third time in one week that a superintendent had done this. And what was the this? The this was to begin a ceremony by talking about the importance of our armed forces, uh, to acknowledge the people in the audience who had served, and then to identify by name all the graduates who were enlisting in, in, in the military. And then at one of those venues actually had a recruiter speak. And, uh, and I said to myself, could that have possibly happened when I was in high school? It, I'm sure it did, but I have no frame of reference for either of those being the points of emphasis that they were. So I think one of the things that's really important and it is difficult to do uh, for many of us because, and I think about, for example, the work that, that Amy does, for example, where she's crossing boundaries all the time and for her to retain her voice and to have voice the question is, how do I frame this? When do I speak? When do I don't speak? When do I, but, but, but all the while being very mindful of the positionality and what, who I am, what I value, what I believe in, and how do I move forward? Susan does the same thing in, a, in the College of Engineering. Terry Link does the same thing, did it for years at Michigan State. You all do it. Those are very important things because if we exercise our voice, uh, in ways that do not enable that hope to be actualized, we end up, in some cases, and I've certainly done this, you cause more damage than the good that you hope to do. Uh, and then you're either, either marginalized or ostracized. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's frightening, actually. Um, that's the takeaway I have, Ruben, that uh, certainly I'm not ready as you are to, to even get close to give up, but the circumstances border on frightening. As Susan pointed out in the chat room, we in Michigan had the General Motors Institute. Uh, I mean, that, that was what created in the 50s or 60s. 
Uh, and so, um, wow, it's just- uh, 19, 1926. 1926, mm -hmm. wow. And, and just to add to that, it was actually Kettering who right. pushed for the use of tetraethyl lead, despite the fact that they knew that ethanol was an anti-knocking agent, but they didn't want to use ethanol because they couldn't patent the production of ethanol and they were afraid of how it would impact the petroleum industry. So they continued and then went for tetraethyl lead, even though the public health community railed against it. It was known neurotoxin and the German scientists that discovered tetraethyl lead actually stopped working on it because he, was a, he knew it was a neurotoxin. And yet mm -hmm. we dumped more than seven tons of tetraethyl lead in the environment over the years that we used it. You know, those things need to be sure. talked about, particularly when they're close to home. And I really value a colleague on the West Coast who wrote an article recently calling out the New York Times for, for not including in the obituary of, of Eli Broad, who gave millions of, and did millions and millions of dollars in a variety of venues, including higher education, our business college at school at uh, Michigan State is named after him. But if you know what Eli Bro did, he, he invested a significant amount of his lifetime to try to ruin the public education system in Los Angeles. Uh, and what was interesting is that uh, nowhere in that New York Times obituary uh, was there any conversation, any comment about, about the fact this was a very complex human being uh, and that he did a lot of good, but he also did a lot of harm. And at Michigan State, if you were to speak negatively about Eli Broad on a platform, you just can't do that. Thank you, Frank and Susan. Zach, you've had your hand up for a while. Hey, everybody. I just, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this question of hope um, and you know the relationship between sort of critique and resistance and, and what comes next. Um, I also appreciated Amy's comment in the chat just now about sort of like celebrating the institution, but at the same time recognizing you know its shortcomings. I, to me, um, you know, I, I teach graphic design and user experience design, and so. I, I teach in a very sort of pre-professional setting, um, despite the fact that that's not really, has, has very little to do with what my, my research is. Um, and so I have to be very careful about taking the kinds of perhaps radical things I teach my students about and enabling them to couch those within the lingo of the disciplines that they'll be entering. And I think that that's, honing that skill has actually been something that's given me some hope, which is that I have been able to have really important conversations about like Amazon's labor practices, for example, uh, and, you know, give students channels through which they can like make work, but then also have those kinds of conversations and use the kinds of things that they're making as a, as a platform for those conversations. But I would also say the other thing that's given me hope um, is, is really thinking about like what we can learn from, the you know the global south writ large but in particular uh sort of self-organized communities in the global south i'm thinking about like the zapatistas um but also lots of other people doing really interesting stuff um you know in communities across the globe but definitely particularly in south america at least those are the ones i'm more familiar with um arturo escobar writing about sort of moving into moving from like the critical development space into the design space and really starting to imagine like alternative futures that are not, you know, these, these Elon Musk, you know, space libertarian garbage that we keep getting shoved down our throats, um, but actually a much more humble and, and maybe more interesting way to live. And, um, you know, those are the kinds of things that I'm, I'm really excited about right now. Uh, and that's definitely a shift in my, in my focus too, um, in terms of my, my work. So that's sort of, that's what I'm, what I'm into right now. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate that. Uh, anyone else have a comment or a question? I think off of, you know, Amazon, you know, Amazon and Zapatista's band, you're bringing me back to 1994. Uh, and that's good. I, I, 
And what I found was a lot of professors, neoliberal professors, um, were getting their dissertations off of the Zapatistas and writing about the Zapatistas, but not giving any money to the Zapatistas, right? Um, which I, I uh, sent a whole bunch of bicycles to uh, Chiapas. And then, um, and then we had like this big caravan from Houston, Texas and Austin, Texas. And we sent a whole bunch of bikes and we fixed them up and we got them going and things like that. And then, you know, you can see the Zapatistas riding bikes, you know, in pictures and things like that. And we, you know, we gave, you know, hundreds, um, you know, 500 bikes to them and tuned them up and tubes and things. And I think the, the, the essence is being creative, right? That's where the hope is. Like we have to be creative while we're being hypocrites we are hypocrites like all academics in an, a violent situation are hypocrites so we're hypocrites with hope and we need that creativity which hip-hop pedagogy provides us right um and i think you know uh the Koch brothers uh are you know looking at what zach said about amazon the Koch brothers are doing um a a, a very dangerous move they're co-opting justice workshops and trainings in universities um and they're funding them so you think you're walking into like this highlander school ruckus society earth first you know uh black lives matter workshop and it's being funded behind the closed doors of the Koch brothers and so we need to do our research on who's funding these workshops at these universities and colleges and i also want to i want you all like Frank, you were saying, like, where do we go from here? We got to support activists and unions. Koch brothers are anti-activist and anti-union um, from day one. And I think we need to support activists and unions. And, and, and as, as professors, we need to defend our radical students. Um, even if we don't support, as a great, uh, a great theorist said, we might not def like, you know, agree with the word you say, but we'll defend the, the, the right for you to say it. And I think we need to, as critical theorists and, and professors, we need to fight and protect students for doing activism. Not, oh, well, you have to be in a student group and you have to have five students in your group, you have to have minutes, and then you have to pay a fee to, uh, to rent out the quad, and it has to be filled out six months prior, and then you can do a protest. And if you don't, like we did provide you this space, but if you didn't, we're gonna arrest you, right? Like, like it's basically like six months, the campus is gonna be closed in the summer. Like I just started the semester. So they strategically did this, and I think, the Koch brothers are very much supportive of charter schools and they're very much supportive of private prisons. Private prisons and charter schools are the exact same. They're getting funding from the government to do whatever they want to do and they're giving money to private indus industries and in in interests, right? So I think, yeah, we need to support unions which are being destroyed state by state by state, right? Um, and, uh, and I think every single opportunity you like, as Frank, I think you said, you know, you have a recruiter. We need to bring in our union recruiters. We need to bring in our activist recruiters and saying like, okay, you're going to go work for JCPenney or, um, or Subway or Pizza Hut or whatever. You've got to like help um, and, and join a union. Um, and at the same time, join an activist group because they're going to, they're going to defend you when you're alone and getting kicked out because you can't work hard enough or you speak, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's what I would say, Frank. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, Zach, for your points. Thank you for that, Anthony. Uh, Frank, we have about two or three minutes left. I don't know if you want to make some closing comments or if there is anyone else who'd like to make a closing comment. Well, uh, one more question before we close. I have a closing comment if we have time. Yes, here. please. Yes, we can turn to, to Eric and uh, and Anthony for final comments, and then I'll have uh, close. So thank you, Ruben, for facilitating the conversation. Eric, please. Great. And of course, thank everyone for being here. Um, I've enjoyed the, the chat with Susan and Amy and Stephen and Zach about this crisis of measurability, and I really uh, appreciate everyone's comments, and I appreciate Amy's final comment on uh, optimism. Right and, and and ways that we can address this and we, we do have the opportunity. Um, in the afterword of our book, uh, Kim Socha, who is also a writing professor, 
she says it's time for us to make space for alternative ways of knowing that have been traditionally that have traditionally been eschewed in higher education mm. and that's something that i think we can do in our work and the more we advertise it the more we celebrate it the more we publish it or speak about it in these forums then the more it can become mainstream and that more than we can address we can have those narratives and earlier i mentioned action research and conversation didn't go there today and that's fine um and, and you know jan's applied research that she mentioned in the intro but uh you know consider alternative methods of research uh consider being rhetorical about your methodology and, and what you choose to do and the more we do that the more we publish on our we're all pro-academics the more we publish and explain and celebrate our work in our communities the more that's going to be accepted in academia the more we use boyer's model of scholarship of application instead of our traditional scholarship of discovery the more that that's going to become mainstream and that's where all of this so thank you so much for being here everyone. and thank you for your great question hmm. anthony any comments to close I thank everybody for your time. Um, and I think, uh, you know, uh, as I said, support your union, support your local activists. Um, and uh, don't try to critique your local activist, you know. Um, and I think uh, recently there was an article on, on you know, how, how activists should not, you know, be so radical and burning things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, you might know the, uh, the, the author, I think his work is great, but I also think like, um, if people want to express themselves in radical ways that we might not understand, let them do it. Um, and it's not performative. Um, and, uh, sometimes it is, but we can't just blanket, you know, all radical people in some, you know, a dogmatic, you know, generalizing um, framework. And I think we need to look at the nuances of uh, not always coming together and being uh, de-escalating. Sometimes, you know, the only reason, sad to say, in my opinion, as a professor of social justice activism and sociology and critical criminology, the only reason why George Floyd um, is being spoken about is because people started burning stuff down. Right. Like, I'm sorry, it wasn't the amount of petitions on the streets like and um, but it was also professors and students speaking, dialoguing, zooming, conversations, organizing banners, et cetera. Like there was so much going on. Right. Like it wasn't just the burning of, the, of, of, of cars and stuff like that, but that had something to do with it. And I think that had something also because I lived in Minneapolis for five years and I knew a lot of activists there and I still do that there was a guilty charge because everybody from the judges to the correction officers to the department of justice knew that if that person wasn't found guilty, Minneapolis would have burned down. And like, and I think that like, if I'm saying something that you all don't like understand, like, let me know. But I think that's a common normalcy of that what was going on right like and i think that what the, the problem is that is every time we need justice we need to do that we need to put fear in people like that's really sad right like we can't and i think like i don't want to get to that state but that's the state that we got to in minneapolis right um uh, and and some of the organizers noted that right so um on two days four days away from george floyd's anniversary of his assassination i just like you know, um, let's not forget George Floyd and so many others, Eric um, Gardner, um, and, and the list goes on, Fred Hampton, et cetera, that were um, violently murdered at the hands of uh, authoritarianism. So thank you so much. Um, that's what I would kind of want to close with. Well, thank you so much, Eric and Anthony, and also our discussants, uh, Jason and Amy, and all of you who are in the Zoom room and have been watching live on YouTube. Very important, invigorating conversation, really important. What we'll do is that uh, uh, this, uh, this video will be up on our YouTube channel, which you can find at Future U, the letter U, 
Future You, Neoliberalism in Higher Education. And also let me put a plug in for our website, which you can find at Future You, again, Future, the letter U dot education. And also our Twitter feed, which you can find at Neoliberal HE, HE standing for higher education. Um, I want to thank all of you for participating. Uh, we hope, obviously, to do more of these forums in the future, and we hope to see a number of you back again as we move forward. So uh, final comments uh, from you, Ruben, before we sign off. Uh, just one last, uh, we, uh, colleague and I, uh, edited a special issue of the Social Science Journal uh, on neoliberalism and higher education. Frank has a piece in there on neoliberalism and higher education sports. And we have Janice Newsom and many others who have uh, contributed articles. So please keep an eye out for that in the uh, fall probably. Uh, and we're planning on having a uh, forum of this sort uh, with the uh, authors. So looking forward to that. Thank you, Ruben. And thank all of you for watching and listening. This is Frank Fear for Future You, and we hope to see you again very soon.